This is the Business Experience Show, where we talk to entrepreneurs about the challenges and successes of starting, owning, or operating a business. Welcome back to the Business Experience Show with Joel Dorsey and Brian Gaps. I'm your host, Lisa Caprelli. Our next guest is all too familiar with The Living Dad. As publisher of the prestigious Famous Monsters of Filmland, he resurrected the magazine itself from the dead. Welcome publisher, producer, and writer, Philip Kim. Thank you very much. How you doing, Philip? I'm doing hey, great. For those who are not familiar with the magazine, can you tell us a little about it? Well, it's, uh, it's a magazine that was started in uh, February of 1958 uh, by two guys, uh, James Warren and uh, Forrest J. Ackerman. Um, Forrest J. Ackerman was, uh, you know, he was probably the very first... A cosplay um, fan. Wow! Uh, he he showed up to the nineteen. I guess it was the nineteen thirty one World Fair when when the television was first introduced in a spaceman cal- in an outfit, uh, spaceman's uh, outfit, and um, mm-hmm. he just uh, he collected memorabilia. He used to uh, uh, be friends with the guys who used to clear out the the lots oh. in uh, in um, in the studios after they would do a B movie. And uh, he would dumpster dive for artifacts, <laughs> and uh, and he had this incredible collection. He he was a really really interesting guy. And him and uh, James Warren decided to put out a, a an interesting uh, horror slash fantasy magazine in 1958. And Puritan America was not ready for it, but the kids <laughs> were. And so when they put it out, they they didn't really understand what they were doing. It was just kind of a fun one off, and it sold out. And, you know, they're born a magazine and it ran for 25 years Mm -hmm. as a black and white magazine. And in 1983, they closed their doors because of, you know, things went color. And uh, and so, yeah, and we we brought it back in 2007. Wow. Now, there was a little drama in there as well, because yours is the second revival of the legendary magazine. The first attempt was. Uh, from what I've read, an unauthorized and litigated and eventually stopped uh, attempt. And then you came into the picture at the end of all that and bought the rights. Um, and, and what made you get into this very specific niche of publishing? Well, you know, I, I never actually got up in the morning and <laughs> said, I want to be a publisher. It's it's. N- I mean, a publisher I think, of a monster magazine. R- right. <laughs> well, well, you know, I read the magazine as a kid, and that's what inspired me to become a filmmaker or you know wanted right. to be a film, filmmaker aspiring filmmaker and um but you know i i was told by a friend that it was coming up for auction and it was kind of a weird surreal opportunity I, I mean when i went i didn't have any thought that i was gonna be purchasing the magazine i um I right went, who would have thought you were reading that as a young child and right and, and i wanted to know what all this drama was about so i went and um there was nobody else in the courtroom because the the <laughs> The second guy, his bankruptcy went on for seven years. Oh so um, anybody who would have been a prospective uh, oh. buyer had lost interest. And so I was sitting there and the judge said, you know, this is the longest bankruptcy I've ever, <laughs> you know, tenured over, uh, you know, get rid of it. And I just said, I'll, I'll take it. So it was very fortuitous. And and um, and yeah, it's, it's been a great experience. What, what has been the struggles with, with your business, as many businesses have? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because when you pick up an existing brand, that's what everybody's trying to do. You know, Disney mm-hmm. bought Marvel. Everybody is mm-hmm. trying to uh, get that. And, and I just want to kind of say, you know, part of the business model there is you can throw a billion dollars at something, but you're not necessarily going to win the hearts of the viewers or the audience right you know Good what point. yeah what you're doing is you know when disney purchased marvel it isn't because they there aren't artists that can draw spider-man it was because those were things that had passed on to at least two generations mm-hmm. you can't you can't recreate that except with time <laughs> so <laughs> so you know when we when we saw this um our unique challenges weren't that there weren't fandom the unique challenges were that um, that there was an expectation. So, you know, this magazine, uh, Peter Jackson, Guillermo del Toro, uh, Steven Spielberg, I mean, you name it, they grew up watch, reading this magazine, and they'll tell you it's the one thing that, if they had to p- pinpoint one reason why they became a filmmaker, this was the magazine. Now, it's I take inspiration. Absolutely. And I take no credit for this right. because I didn't start it, but the challenges of being a, uh, a third publisher, in essence, um, is 
dreams or memories can be much greater than what the realities were. So the challenge is, is it's to it's to not just bring the magazine back in the spirit that it was in, but it's also to make it so that it meets people's. Yeah. And you told me that you were first interested in the brand itself mm -hmm. and the magazine sort of came about again because of the public clamoring for it. A absolutely. So when I, again, it was a, it was kind of a, um, a rash decision. When I, yeah, I just raised my hand. Do you tend to do that? Not really, <laughs> okay. but but it's one of those things. It's like, hey, RC Cola is available. Do you want it? And you're like, I'll, I guess I'll think yeah. about it after I own it. You know. So, um, so uh, you know, I picked it up. I mean, I knew what the magazine was about, so it wasn't completely foreign. Um and I thought, hey, this is great. You know, the, this was in 07, by the way. So a lot's happened in five years. There was no iPad back then. So uh, it was just coming out. And so, um, you know, I looked at it as this would be a great transition into the new media. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fans weren't having it. They, they said, you know, we want to see this in paper. You know, we want to see this uh, tactily. And, you know, so we went into print. I had to learn how to be a publisher. Wow. And it wasn't hard necessarily because there was a lot of people who wanted to see this happen also. So who you had a lot of collaboration. Absolutely. A lot of team effort. I know Absolutely. Joel Joe himself has had has been in the publishing field and it's it's a lot of work. Oh yeah, yeah. And it's, it's it's stressful. It's a lot of work, and uh, certainly wasn't as big as what you're talking about, and or, or as famous. <laughs> right. I have friends who are publishers. Um, I have a, a friend who's a publisher for San Diego Magazine. He's going to be on our show in in the next coming month, and I ask him the question, "What's the hardest thing about having a, a magazine business?" And he says, "Having to start over every month." And then I said, "What's the fun thing about having a magazine? Starting to, having to start over every yep. month. You never start learning." How far out as you, as being a publisher for your magazine how far do you plan them oh two years wow well you know we are we're a magazine definitely we're a periodical but uh -huh. we approach you know if you want news mm -hmm. you get it on the blogs it's instantaneous what what people want now from magazines are things that they can keep things they can a keepsake absolutely mm -hmm. so for instance you know the reason why the cook ma cooking magazines and the and the the craft magazines do so well is they, people don't throw them away it's hard to throw away something that's worth something of value that's right and they look through it and they can get reference points and that's what Famous Monsters was I mean the reason it was so successful you know in, in 1958 is you, you, you would look at a movie and you would say it's magical wow. I, I have no idea how they you know, and it was obviously bad special effects comparison to today, <laughs> but it's like, how do they make that saucer flow? Oh, right. <laughs> and so, you know, and, and what they did was they went back and said, oh, this is what you did. This is what you did. You went ahead and, you know, put the light behind this cutout and then you superimposed it and you <laughs> over, you know, whatever it is. And, and people like Guillermo would look at it and say, really? <laughs> Have you That's counted how many issues of uh, Famous Monsters of Filmland are, are in existence? Yeah, there's, um, well, there's 200 and uh, there's, we're, we're on our 264th Wow, issue. congratulations. Thank you. Uh, it's a bi-monthly um, and so and I'm glad uh, you pointed it out that you said that people it's more of a keepsake and and uh, with magazines uh, with technology being in existence and people be able to being able to find content online a lot of publishers have struggled with keeping print in, in circulation uh, absolutely and we the interesting thing about our business is and I'm grateful every day because mm -hmm. um, we're growing mm -hmm. and I know that our you know I know that the industry is not it's it's degrading backwards and I can honestly tell you that every issue, our our readership grows, and our you know because again we already had a hardcore fan base, and so and, and and the funny thing is we're probably the only film magazine whose demographics range from like thirteen <laughs> to eighty. That's a huge demographic. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, are your are your magazines now the current ones uh, as collectible as the past issues? Yes, uh, we're the only current magazine where some issues are actually selling for over two, three hundred dollars wow. on eBay, um, and and it wasn't by design. When we came out, we said, "Hey, let's," because the the magazine was known for its cover art too. Some of the most famous artists in the comic book and film industry started when they were eighteen or twenty on Famous Monsters. So uh, we continue that tradition, 
And so, um, uh, yeah. And you've also taken the opportunity to give undiscovered artists a chance. A- absolutely. Um, you know, I, I want to call out Jason Edmondson in, in particular. He is, uh, he's an amazing Canadian artist. And, uh, you know, he was, he was, a, you know, he was a working artist in his own right prior mm-hmm. to uh, donning a cover of FM. But when he did, it changed for him. And, uh, you know, his career took a very positive, different path. And we're very good friends, and he still does covers for us. And that's really what FM did. They took a lot of artists that were unknown, and they became... Frank Frazetta did work for, um, for FM and for Warren Publishing. And he is, you know, his, he's deceased now, but his originals auctioned for two, three, four million dollars. And so. FM is for Famous Monsters of Filmland. Yes, Land. I'm, I'm sorry, yes. No, I'm, giving <laughs> it, I'm covering your bases. <laughs> sure. uh, who's your favorite person you've met as a result of the magazine? That is really an unfair question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the reason I say that is... You've met spot. so many people. Well, it's interesting because I'll meet somebody and I'm like, this guy's my favorite <laughs> guy. And, 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 <laughs> you know, and, and then Brian's the next... laughing because right. I do that all the time. Right, and I'm then like, I meet oh the next guy. I'm like, this guy's my favorite guy. <laughs> you, you're currently Lisa's favorite. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and, it's, and, and it's not like that. It's just everybody has... You know, by the time you're making $100 million movies, the studios aren't giving you that job because... They like it. <laughs> They're doing it because you're good. You've earned it. Yeah. yeah. So speaking of filmmaking, you used to you you've made films, right? That's how you got your start. Right. Right. Yeah. And then you now you're on the internet. You're doing the magazine. Uh, what else? What else you got going that uh, that you like to tell us about? Uh, well, you know, again, my initial uh, purpose for acquiring FM was to uh, turn it into a, a a film television brand, and right now we're working on. Um, several television and, and film uh, projects. The one thing that is really kind of dear to me is Forrest J. Ackerman, who I mentioned was one of the two um, founders. He he was like, I mean, his name was Forrest, but he was like Forrest Gump. He was everywhere. He was there. And so, you know, the the, the project we're doing is um, uh, his, his bio, uh, film on his life. So, yeah. If someone wanted to follow in your footsteps, what advice would you give them on what to do and what not to do? Don't. Don't, don't. give advice. <laughs> don't, yeah, yeah, don't give advice. No. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, w- I would honestly say, you know, a lot of people I see coming into the entertainment industry, and, and myself included, mm-hmm. somehow you kind of leave your brain at the door because it's so overwhelming. It's everything that you dreamt of. And so you start making bad decisions and, you know, really approach it as if it's a plumbing business. You know, I mean, seriously, or, 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 you know, a grocery store or something, you know, go in there understanding that at the end of your filmmaking, somebody's got to pay you for it. And if it's not a good product, right. no one's going to pay you for it. <laughs> Before we go to break, tell us uh, what your belief system is about dreams. Um, dreams? Um, dreams are great. I think, I think dreams are the only things that kind of the magic left. I mean, you know, we don't live in a great time <laughs> right and i mm-hmm. think i think dreams are what gets us through these kind of hard times and, and I, i'm a big fan of it i, I read that you, you wrote dreams are the main driver for anything you want to do but knowledge is the engine absolutely well we got to take a great a quick break for more information about famous monsters of filmland magazine or to reach us go to the business experience show.com we're here to help your business grow with marketing strategy and business experience go to the business experience show.com follow us on facebook twitter we'll be right back you're listening to the business experience show with famous monsters of filmland i'm lisa caprelli joe dorsey we'll be right back you're listening to angels radio ama 30 klaa <laughs> Have you lost your luster? Are you a professional who needs a little help getting back on top where you were just a few short years ago? Need to put the passion and fun back into what you do? Business coaching and marketing consulting can help. Hi, I'm Lisa Caprelli from the Business Experience Show. For over 20 years, I have helped to motivate and market business leaders. Take advantage of this business experience to put the gloss back in your life. Get a completely unbiased and refreshing perspective from a professional outsider. Change your outlook by rotating your view just a few degrees. Entrepreneurs, CEOs, doctors, lawyers, and entertainment professionals have benefited from my business, marketing, and coaching. Visit GoGlossy.com. If you feel you could benefit from increased motivation, please contact me today to discuss a free consultation. Call 949-415-8237. 
That's 949-415-8237 or visit goglossy.com to put the luster back in your life. Welcome back to The Business Experience Show, where you can learn from others' experiences and successes in business. Welcome back to The Business Experience Show. I'm Lisa Caprelli with Brian Gaps and Joel Dorsey. We're talking with famous monsters of Filmland. Your online store is CaptainCo.com, and I saw online you sell the Talky Tina doll from one of the scariest Twilight Zone episodes from my childhood. Uh, it's still creeping me out. <laughs> what else do you sell there? And tell us a little bit about CaptainCo.com. Well, CaptainCo.com, was it's actually Captain Company. Um, so a little bit of history about how that was developed. Uh, James Warren, the publisher, mm-hmm. um, in 1958, could not get anybody to advertise with him because it was a horror magazine. Uh, and, and magazines, obviously, as you know, live on uh, on the, uh, the ad revenues. He just couldn't do it. And so he was struggling with this. You know, it was selling so fast, but he still couldn't make ends meet. So he um, he went ahead and uh, um, created a online store, or a, I mean, a mail order store. It was called Captain Company, and he just started selling anything he can get his hands on that was quirky and weird. So, like the uh, the you know the uh, vampire fangs that glow in the d- glow in the dark. Like when he saw it, he, you know he picked it up and put it in there. He used to do stuff like uh, Live Monkeys, $99 or $9.95, and then put sold out. And kids would buy these issues <laughs> every time they would get, you know, saying, when is it going to be back in stock? Because I want a live monkey. So it was, it was a, it was a, <laughs> it was a, <laughs> that's brilliant marketing. <laughs> it, it was. I mean, you couldn't do that now, I don't think. But, but the point is, you know, they did everything possible back in the day to, um, to, you know, get relevance. And, um, and so, Captain Company is actually one of the oldest mail order companies still in existence. And of course, now we're online, and and because of the internet, you know, you can't find you know really unique pieces all the time. So what we've done is we've partnered up with a lot of boutique uh, license companies like Entertainment Earth, um, uh, Hermes Press. Uh, you know, there's uh, you know, uh, Bluefin, a lot of uh, Southern California companies that find these um, these licensed products and and we, we sell it. So it is very much in the same tradition as the uh, original Captain Company, uh, but now it's online. Yeah, the magazine, the magazine uh, it's always had like a cultish following. Absolutely. If, if I remember correctly, it's, it was pretty much all cultish. Um, how have you changed that now t- to make it more mainstream? Well, I mean, I think it, we haven't done anything. I think, you know, cult has become mainstream um mm-hmm. y- you know if you if you went to uh <laughs> if you went to abc back in 1978 when dallas was on and you said hey i'd like to do a zombie television show they'd look at you like you were i mean they wouldn't even you couldn't get through the door today you've got walking dead which is one of the highest rated shows yeah. on television mm-hmm. and and amc's you know it, it that's a great that's channel a- and and so you know that that's that's i i don't think we've done anything i think Times have changed. I think the kids who grew up um, being fearful of their parents in in wanting to entertain themselves with fear and fantasy. So, We talked about you got into the business interested in the um, naming rights, the marketing rights. You have other things going on. Tell us a little bit about what else you have beyond the magazine. Okay. Well, uh, one of the things that we're doing is, well, licensing is, is a big uh, portion of what we're doing. Um, we're licensing, uh, we're partnering with uh, high-end publishers like Hermes Press to do archival um, repackaging of, of old issues. Um, we're, we've partnered up with Dark Horse, which is, uh, I mean, it's one of the major three um, comic book and, and memorabilia companies. Um, and they're creating statues of Forrest J. Ackerman and, and such. And so there, there's a lot happening in the licensing field, you know, and, and, and hopefully the television uh, field is uh, also, you Bobbleheads, know, bobbleheads. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Talking Tina bobbleheads. <laughs> uh, Philip, give us one last message about Famous Monsters of Filmland. Well, Famous Monsters of Filmland has been here or has been uh, in one form or another uh, in existence for 54 years. Mm-hmm. 
and I'm positive well after I'm, you know, it's done with me. <laughs> It'll continue. So that's my last word. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. Sure. Philip Kemp, publisher of Famous Monsters of Filmland Magazine. We also had Rochelle Ryder, co-owner of Orange Label Advertising. If you'd like to be a guest on this business show, go to our website, thebusinessexperienceshow.com. If you have a friend or family member who can benefit from showcasing their business on radio, contact me. I'm Lisa Caprelli. Thank you, Joe Dorsey. Thank you, Brian Gapps, producer of our show, Production assistant Ben Burke. The music by Mike Warner. Thank you for listening. Have a profitable week. Uh, we'll see you next week on Angels Radio AM 830 KLAA. We are also happy our show is now on iTunes. For more information, go to thebusinessexperienceshow.com. See you next week. <laughs>